Hey, uh, I'm so glad that you're here. Thank you so much for taking some time to be here with us. Um, I also wanted to recognize a very special group of people. That's our first time guests. So if you're here for the first time, first time in a while, we're so thankful that you decided to join us. You can give it up for everyone who's here for the first time. We don't do golf claps in the U. We celebrate, we honor. We're so glad that you're here. Hey, real quick, before we get started, let's welcome our online community. We love you so much. Thank you for tuning in with us. Let's give it up for everyone viewing online. So thankful for you, wherever you're tuning in from. Hey, uh, tonight we are starting a new series entitled Full Send, Full Send. And the whole premise of this series is we're gonna be talking about probably the most common question that all of humanity asks. In fact, they've done studies in polls, and this is one of the most common questions that people get. And it's one of the most common questions because there's really not an, a great answer all the time. And it's, why am I here? What is my purpose? Why am I on this earth? What's my reason for being here? It's a question that we all at one point or another have either, either asked ourselves or we are currently wrestling with right now. What's my purpose for being here? Why am I here on this earth? Here's what I found. God has hardwired humanity to crave and desire certain things. One of those things is relationship and community. We all have this hardwiring from God to desire and crave community, to have a desire for relationship. Whether you knew it or not, you have a hardwiring by God to desire and crave relationship, to desire and crave connection. God placed that in you for a purpose and a reason. You also have a hardwiring on the inside of you. You desire, whether you realize it or not, to live a life of significance to do something that means something. Come on, somebody. We all have a desire, whether we know it or not, whether it's tapped into or maybe untapped up to this point, we all have a desire to do something that means something. And that is placed by God. God has hardwired humanity to crave community and relationship, and he has also hardwired humanity to desire significance to know that we are not just occupying space while we're here, to know that by the end of our days, we're not gonna look back and just say, well, I made a lot of money. Well, I guess I had a lot of friends. No, we are going to look back and ask the question, who am I bringing with me when I'm going to heaven? Who am I bringing with me? That's the only thing that counts. That's the only thing that matters when we all come to our day, when we all transition to heaven. We get to bring one thing. As people, but we are all hungry for and desire significance. Maybe you didn't realize it, but God has placed a desire in you to lead a life of significance, to do something that means something. And tonight I'm gonna preach a message entitled Saved to be Sent. Saved to be sent. Let's pray and then we'll hop into our conversation. Heavenly Father, we invite you into this space. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your grace that is sufficient, for your power that's made perfect in our weakness. God, thank you for speaking to us when we prepare our hearts to receive from you. We ask that whatever thing you need to speak, that you would speak it. God, we ask that whatever thing is needed, that you'd provide those needs for every person in this room or watching online. God, we're thankful that as we open our eyes, our ears, and our hearts to receive from you, as we come with an attitude of faith, oh, we're thankful that you can speak and you can confirm and you can reveal things to us in a mighty and profound way. And God, we are thankful for the Cleveland Browns in Jesus' name. Everyone agree with this, Ed? I was expecting a louder amen on that one. Hey, a few years ago, I was having a meeting with a, a student who had just graduated from high school. And, and we were just catching up. It was not too long after COVID. And so every, everyone was shut down. All, all things were shut down. And this was not too long after, you know, things were starting to open back up. And he had graduated during that year. And so he graduated, he was ready to go to college. And we met up and we were talking about his future, just having a good conversation. You know, we were having a good conversation about his future, his desires, his dreams. It was really good. You know, we, we prayed at the end and I prayed over his future and it was just a good conversation. It was enriching, it was impactful for me. It was really good. And then we started walking towards our cars. And as soon as we started walking towards our cars, he made this comment, he said, he said, hey man, my mom was so surprised when I said I was meeting with you. 
And in my mind, I'm like, oh, really? <laughs> Instantly thinking the best of myself, <laughs> how we do. In my humanity, in my flesh, I'm like, oh, really? <laughs> What'd she say? <laughs> thinking that she said something really nice and uplifting about me. Thinking he's about to say that she was gassing me up. Oh, that man of the Lord. <laughs> it's great that you met with him. He says, yeah, I had a conversation with my mom, and she was kind of surprised. And she asked, who, who, are, you, who are you going to get coffee with? And, and I said, well, Mom, I'm going with Austin Blyer. He's a leader at my church. And his mom looked at him and said, hmm, well, good to hear things have changed for him. Ouch is right. <laughs> I was like, ooh, that definitely was not going in the direction I thought it was going in. And honestly, in the moment, I'm like, okay. Uh, oh, that was not what I was expecting. Why are you telling me this right now? This is not really encouraging to me at all. Uh, it would have been better to just keep to yourself, but that's okay. But have you ever been in a position where something's said to you, something's done to you, and it just unlocks something on the inside of you? It just sparks and ignites something on the inside of you. I can't tell you what it was in the moment. I can tell you now what it was. But something ignited on the inside of me in that conversation. And I think the same is true for Isaiah. Something was ignited on the inside of Isaiah. We're going to read in Isaiah 6. We're going to read verses 1 through 8. I think something was ignited on the inside of Isaiah. And we're going to read about this. But before we do, I want to read the first verse. Then I'm going to give you a little bit of context so that you know where we're at. So Isaiah 6, we're going to read verse 1 first. It says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. There's a few things to keep in mind before we unpack this story. The first one is, there was a mention of time in relation to an event, which would mean that that event was significant. There was a, a reference to time, in the year that King Uzziah died, which would signify that there's some significance to his death. And here's why. He started, he started his, his uh, rule as king at the age of 16. He was 16 years old, and for 50 years, he sat on the throne as the king and the leader of Israel. 50 years. I want you to contextualize it for a moment. We think that eight years for a presidency is a long time. Multiply that by 5.5. <laughs> That's how long this guy was king, which would mean that for many people, the majority of their life, this guy was sitting on the throne. But he wasn't just an ordinary king. If you look through First and Second Kings and you read about the different kings through Israel and throughout Israel's history, there was a combination of good kings and bad kings, kings that led well and kings that didn't lead that great. And how many of you know that just because you have a position doesn't make you a great leader? Just because you have the title doesn't make you a great leader. It takes commitment, sacrifice, character, integrity. King Uzziah, he led uprightly in the eyes of the Lord. He was one of the few that led well, and he did it for a long period of time. But towards the end of his reign and his rule, by the end of his, his time as king, some pride and self-centeredness that kind of started to creep in. The end of his reign wasn't, wasn't great, it wasn't pretty. It doesn't undo the fact that for decades he led well. He led well in the eyes and the sight of the Lord. But by the end of his time, the way he went out wasn't, wasn't characteristic. And so for Isaiah, this is important, because for Isaiah, he was a prophet in that time. And there's a strong chance that that had a pretty big ripple effect on the people including him. Here's what it goes on to say in verse two. Above him were seraphim. I'm gonna make this really simple. Heavenly hosts that surrounded the throne of God, giving him praise and glory. It's what they did. Each with six wings. I'm not gonna explain this right now. Each with six wings. With two wings, they covered their faces. With two, they covered their feet. With two, they were flying. And they were calling to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of, of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook and the temple was filled with smoke. Isaiah is getting this picture of what's happening in the heavenly realms. And as he looks at it, it's, 
It's glorious and it's magnificent. And it's this display of God's omnipotence, his bigness, his power, his might, his glory. Here's what it goes on to say. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined for I'm a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, see, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And Isaiah said, here I am, send me. Here I am, send me. Isaiah goes all the way from woe is me to send me. In a matter of verses, he goes all the way from woe is me to send me. Wherever there's a problem, send me. Wherever there's darkness, send me. Wherever there's hopelessness, send me. Wherever there's brokenness, send me. He goes all the way from woe is me to send me. You want to send somebody? Send me. I want to be used by you in a powerful way. I want to be used by you wherever you take me, wherever you want me to go. Point in the direction and I'll go. Something happens. Oh, something happens. He started out with woe is me and eventually gets to send me. We're gonna unpack this for a moment. There's some observations from this text that I want us to catch. Here's the first one. An awareness of him creates the greatest awareness of me. An awareness of him creates the greatest awareness of me. Here's what the scripture says. I'm a man of unclean lips and I live among people of unclean lips and my eyes have seen the king. As he was watching and witnessing this revelation and display of what was going on in the heavenly realms, as he set his eyes on what was happening around the heavenly realms, as he got this glimpse and picture of the glory, the majesty, the omnipotence, the goodness, the faithfulness of God, he couldn't help but become so aware of himself. Catch this. You are not meant to stare in a mirror and try to figure out your own stuff. Do not stare in a mirror for too long and try to figure yourself out. You will stare for the rest of your life trying to figure out what to do. There's something that happens when I set my eyes on heaven. When I put my eyes on Jesus, he helps me to become aware of where I'm currently at. And he doesn't do it to exploit our sin. He does it to illuminate our areas of need for him. Because I can't help but figure out that when I put my eyes on Jesus, I become so much more aware of where my need is. There's another story in John chapter four. Jesus has this interaction with this Samaritan woman and they're standing at this well and they're having this conversation. And here's, what, here's what's said. He told her, go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you're right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you've had five husbands and the man you now have is not your husband. What you've just said, is quite true. A couple things to keep in mind. Number one, Jesus never spoke with condemnation. Let's be really clear. But as I read this, and I put myself in the story, this kind of feels like Real Housewives of Bethlehem out here. <laughs> she liked that one. <laughs> Can I be honest? It kind of felt like Real Housewives of Bethlehem. Just put yourself in the story. Hey, go get your husband. I don't have one. <laughs> you're right. You've had five. <laughs> not to mention the guy you're with right now. He's not even your husband. <laughs> but go ahead, go get him. For most of us, we'd read it that way, right? Because sometimes whenever God is helping us to see our areas of sin, we think that he's exploiting it. But here's what the woman went on to say. Catch this. 
she went to her family and she said, come and see a man who told me everything I've ever done. In amazement and awe, there's something comforting about knowing that God knows. There's something comforting about knowing that God understands. There's something comforting about knowing that God sees, he knows, and it doesn't change his position towards me. It doesn't change his affirmation towards me. It doesn't change his love for me. It doesn't change a darn thing. I need to know that when I look at Jesus, he's gonna help me to see my current position. You need to hear this. This is important. The only way we can really be saved is if we repent from our sin. And repentance is a key component of following Jesus. When I recognize my sin, Jesus is not trying to exploit my weakness. He's trying to illuminate a path of understanding for me so that I recognize my need for him. Oh, that interaction with that Samaritan woman was not one of condemnation. Rather, one of conviction that led to change. She says, come and see a man who told me everything that I've ever done. Come, I want to show you this prophet who came to me. He told me everything. To most of us, we'd be like, heck no. <laughs> everything? Like, everything he do? Yeah, he knows everything. But there's something comforting about knowing that he knows. And that when I look at him, it clarifies what I'm not seeing in myself. But I got to look at him. Number two, number two, he alone burns the sin off my life. Again, we're using this text to create some clear observation in how Isaiah went from woe is me to send me. He alone burns the sin off my life. The, fer- the seraphim took a, a hot coal to Isaiah's lips. Of course, we know that we don't receive forgiveness from a hot coal taken to our lips, There's a connection drawn. Something was burned off Isaiah's life. It wasn't because there was a coal connected to his lips. This was a foreshadowing of what Jesus would do for you and me. Because contextually in the Old Testament, it says, here's what it says in Hebrews 9.22. In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. This is the theological understanding we have to carry about what Jesus did. Hear me. In the Old Testament, when you would commit a sin, if you committed error or wrong of any kind, you would have to bring a sacrifice of some sort. There had to be a shedding of blood. So you would have to bring a sacrifice. You would have to bring an offering every time. If you sinned, bring your offering. There has to be a shedding of blood for there to be forgiveness of sin. So that might have came in the package of a pigeon, a dove, an animal of some kind. But when Jesus came, he became the one-time sacrifice for our sin. He became the one-time sacrifice, atonement for your sin and mine. So the difference is in the Old Testament, you'd have to continuously go back to the altar every single time, every time, every time, every time. If you commit sin, you got to go back. Bring your offering. There has to be shedding of blood. So when Jesus shed his blood for you and me, the significance was really great because now forgiveness can come from simply putting our eyes on Jesus, turning from our old ways and looking at him. We have to look at him if we want to become aware of what we need, and then we go right back to him so that he can cleanse us from what we need. We keep our eyes on Jesus. He who knew no sin became sin so that you and me could be the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Man, something changes on the inside of you when you realize how much he's forgiven you of. Something changes on the inside of you. You first have to realize what's there to realize what you've been forgiven of. But he alone helps me to recognize where I'm currently at. He alone helps me to recognize where I currently stand. He alone helps me to see my current position. And once I recognize, because again, Isaiah, he recognized, he said, woe is me. I don't think that was a position of defeat. I think he just recognized, wow, I'm standing in the glory in the presence of almighty God. 
And I see when I look at him, oh, I see how sinful I really am, but how much I really need him. Not a position of condemnation, but one of conviction that leads us to change. Last one, number three. The keys can come up and help me close out. Number three, the burning of sin leads to the fire of being sent. The burning of sin leads to the fire of being sent. Isaiah had a real encounter with the almighty God. He had a real encounter. He had a real moment with God where he recognized his sin. He experienced forgiveness. And now he was on fire to go and do what God called him and purposed him to do. The burning of sin, oh, it leads to the fire of being sent. When you've had a real encounter with grace, when you've had a real encounter with Jesus, when you know who you are, where you've been and what you've done, and you know how much he's cleansed you, renewed you, restored you, forgiven you, delivered you from, oh, there's nothing like recognizing and knowing what my God has set me free from. There's nothing like recognizing the grace, the goodness, the mercy, and the faithfulness of our God. There is nothing that will set you on fire more for a life of purpose and meaning and fulfillment. There is nothing that will ignite something on the inside of you more than recognizing what he's done in you. There's nothing more. It's recognizing how sinful I actually am, how much I need him, and putting my trust in him. And that ignites a fire on the inside of me. Oh, that ignites something on the inside of me. Isaiah goes all the way from woe is me to send me. From woe is me to Lord, wherever there's a need, send me. Wherever there's darkness, let me be the light. Wherever there's a problem, let me bring the need. What if we carried that same attitude? What if we carried that same attitude? Can I tell you, you will never get to send me unless you go through the process from woe me all the way through. And to try and get all the way to send me without having first moments of woe me and oh God. <laughs> without first feeling woe me, but oh God, you are so good and you're faithful and no matter how bad I've been how far I've walked away no matter how deep my sin feels you've never walked away from me this is the good news of the grace of Jesus Christ this is the hope of the world this reminder for all of us this is the greatest gift that humanity could ever be given to be set free and redeemed from their sin and the curse of the law the wages of their sin which is death and eternal separation from God there is no greater gift that I can give to the world than you don't have to spend eternity alone you can live with God when you die and not only that, but while we're here, you can have a real relationship with him. There's no greater gift. There's no greater message. There's no greater thing than recognizing the gift that we've been given in Jesus. Woe is me to send me. Wherever you want to take me, send me. Send me. You know, whenever I think back to that story that I was telling at the beginning, it ignited something in me. You know what it showed me? Someone notices the difference. Because that's not who I am anymore. That guy that you knew, that ain't me anymore. And glory to God that that's not me anymore. But we have to give people a picture of the difference that Jesus makes. So that story, that moment, that encounter, it actually unlocked something on the inside of me. Instead of allowing it to make me, <laughs> come on, instead of allowing it to deter me, instead of allowing it to defeat me, I'm so thankful that it actually ignited something in me. Man, if she noticed it, someone else can. 
Not I, but Christ that lives dwells on the inside of me. People need to see the change that he makes. And it should turn some eyes. Because when I think back to who I was, but who I am now in Christ, Jesus is the one who's made the difference the whole way through. That's our story. (laughs) Jesus made the difference. The only difference between you and me, unsaved person, Jesus. The only difference between me and you, individual who feels far from God, it's just Jesus. I'm not better. I'm not more qualified. I'm not prettier. I just know Jesus. But I believe this. I believe that God is sending us and he's looking for a group of people. He's looking for a group of college-age young adults that would say, yes, God, send me. They would say, yes, God, I want to be a part of what you're doing in the earth. Yes, God, I'm taking my position. I'm taking my stance. Yes, God, I want to be used by you in a powerful way. He's looking for a group of people who will keep their eyes on him so they can be conscious of who they really are, so that their dependence will stay on Jesus, so their reliance will stay on him. He's looking for a group of people who will keep their eyes on him that he can say, yes, go, I'm sending you. There are dying people around you, I'm sending you. There are people whose eternities are weighing in the balance right now, I'm sending you. I'm sending you. (sighs) There's no greater purpose to be a part of than the purpose of Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time. God, thank you for every person under the sound of my voice. Lord, we we could be so many other places right now, doing so many other things, but we're here. We're either in this room or we're watching online. We're here. And God, whatever thing you need to reveal, we're thankful that you're revealing it right now in Jesus' name. God, if we need to become more aware of ourselves, thank you that all it takes is one moment of looking at you. You bring clarity where there might have been confusion. God, thank you that if there's some sin in our life that we've ignored, all it takes is one moment of looking at you, turning from our ways, looking at you to receive forgiveness of sin. And once we've experienced that, God, thank you that you light a fire on the inside of us. God, thank you for igniting a passion on the inside of every person in this room, every person watching online. God, the stakes are too high. We see the need. We see the need at Kent State. We see the need at Akron University. We see the need at Mount Union. We see the need at every local university in this region. We see the need because we see the brokenness. We see the discouragement. We see the despair. We see the brokenness. We see the darkness. We see the death. And Lord, we're asking that you would send us, send us. We want to be used by you because we know that there's no greater way to be fulfilled than when we're fulfilling a kingdom purpose. God, send us. Provide us with opportunities to share about how great you really are. With all that's bowed and eyes closed, I want to give an invitation. If you're in here and you've never accepted Jesus before, or maybe you have at one point or another, but since then you've walked away from God and maybe tonight you just want to get some things right. Maybe tonight for you, you've walked away from God entirely, disbelieving in him, putting your trust in other things. Maybe tonight you just need a fresh start. Or maybe you are in here and you've never accepted Jesus. You've never turned from your sin. You've never confessed him as Lord. If that's you, on either one of those two invitations, I want to give you an invitation. I'm going to count to three. And on the count of three, I want you to be bold and just slip your hand up. No one's looking around. No one's watching. But I want you to be bold and just slip your hand up if that's you. John 14, 6 says that Jesus said this. He said, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. No one can come to the Father unless they come through and by me. You're not going to get to heaven by works or deeds. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9. We're saved by grace through faith. Not by works, lest any man man could boast. 
There's no boasting. Our only boast is what Jesus did. Our only cry is what Jesus did for you and me. He who knew no sin became sin so that you and me, we could be the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So if that's you, I'm gonna count to three. And on the count of three, I just want you to be bold. Just slip your hand up. One, today's your day. Don't let this moment pass you by. Two, Jesus, he loves you. He bled and died for you. Three, if that's you, why don't you slip your hand up? If that's you, thank you, I see that hand. Thank you, I see that hand. That's awesome. If that's you, God's dealing with your heart, why don't you just slip your hand up? Just put it up high so I can acknowledge it. Thank you, I see that hand. That's awesome. Well, if you're in here and you raised your hand, or you know you should have, I want you to do this. Romans 10, 9 through 10 says that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, we put our belief in trust in his finished work on the cross and that he rose from the dead, you and I can be saved. It takes faith. So I gotta believe in my heart. I just gotta open my mouth and confess that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. So if that's you, you raised your hand or you know you should have, I just want you to repeat the simple prayer after me. Everyone in the room, we're all gonna say it together. Just repeat it after me. Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus to die for me. I believe the price he paid was more than enough to cover my sin and make me a new person. My sins are forgiven in Jesus' name. Everyone agree with it said. Hey, can we give it up for those who prayed that prayer for the first time or rededicated? The Bible says all of heaven is rejoicing. We are rejoicing with you. Best decision you could have ever made. Okay, thank you so much for tuning in and engaging with us for this message. If you made the decision to follow Jesus, you can go ahead and text the U to 94000. And somebody on our team will reach out to you and get in touch with you and get some resources in your hand. Well, hey, again, thanks for joining us and we'll see you next time.